ready to uh, well ready to explore the cosmos, but like through a different lens. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a deep dive into this book, The Musings of Ganymede, A Lover's Odyssey. Yeah. I don't know about you, but uh, this book, it blends these mystical dialogues and scriptural commentary together, and uh, it really makes you think. It does. So it's structured kind of like um, it's a series of these short passages, these really potent little passages. Yeah. The author calls them pearls of wisdom. They're really focusing on the ones that are all about Sirius, the dog star. Okay. But get this, the book, it presents Sirius as way more than just some celestial body. Right. It uh, it describes Sirius as this powerful being, uh, refers to it as the Lord of Sirius. And it connects back to all these um, ancient esoteric traditions that uh, that view the stars with this reverence you just don't see every day. It's almost like, um, like our modern understanding of stars is these giant balls of gas. It's like we're missing something, something bigger, something more profound, yes. something, I don't know, almost alive. Precisely, yeah. And what I think is so fascinating is how the musings of Ganymede places humanity in this whole cosmic picture. Okay. There's this one passage where the Lord of Sirius, he tests these beings called the Shining Ones. Okay. And they're like these other celestial beings. And he asks them to assess humanity. And they totally fail. They totally fail. You would think, like these beings of pure light, you would think they'd have us all figured out. You would think, right. But um, they overlook what this text suggests is humanity's most unique quality, which is our potential for uh, deep and nuanced knowledge and understanding. It, um, it claims that we have this capacity for insight that even these celestial beings, they haven't fully grasped. That's a pretty bold statement. It's like we have this, um, I don't know, this hidden potential just waiting to be unlocked. Right. And maybe, just maybe, it's that potential that makes us so fascinating. Yeah. Even to beings that exist on a whole other plane, you know. Exactly. And that's actually, that's a cornerstone of the philosophy that you find throughout the text. This yeah. idea that humans, we carry a spark of the divine within us. So how do we, I mean, how do we tap into that spark? Well, that's what the text gets really, really interesting. It continually draws this parallel between the physical world, you know, the world around us right. and the hidden nature of the Lord of Sirius. You're saying that the world we experience, you know, with our senses, mm -hmm. that it holds clues to understanding something way bigger than ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. And that actually ties directly to the concept of um, knowing myself. Okay. The text is basically suggesting that by studying the natural world, by uh, really delving deeper into our own selves, yeah. we unlock the keys to understanding the divine. So it's like the microcosm reflecting the macrocosm, right? Yes. Like our inner world mirroring this vastness of the cosmos. Precisely. And it takes it a step further. The text actually reinterprets these stories we might think we already know, like uh, Noah's flood, the trials of Abraham, right. even Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. They're all examined through this lens of Sirius. So it's not just presenting these... Uh, abstract concepts about Sirius and humanity. Right. It's weaving them into these narratives that have resonated with people for centuries. Exactly. And and that's where things start to feel um, really mysterious. It's almost as if the author is suggesting that there's this, uh, this hidden influence of Sirius that runs through all these stories. It's adding another layer of meaning that goes beyond just the surface narrative. That's really going to make me think twice the next time I hear those stories. Yeah. It's like realizing there's a whole other dimension to a painting that you thought you had already explored. And that's just the beginning. The text goes on to suggest that um, that understanding these deeper truths requires more than just you know intellectual knowledge. Yeah. It emphasizes the importance of direct experience experiential learning, um, what's often referred to as gnosis. So it's not enough to just read about the Lord of Sirius right. or try to logically grasp these concepts. We need to like experience them directly. Exactly. The text um, uses the analogy of a blind person trying to understand color. Cool. They can learn the word for blue, but until they actually see it, their understanding is going to be incomplete. Hmm. That makes me think about that story of the Sufi mystic Abu Yazid al mm. you know, bringing that dead ant back to life. Yes. Talk about a direct experience. That's not exactly something you're going to learn from a textbook. Exactly. It's about those moments of um, profound connection and understanding, those moments that, like, transcend language and intellect. Which, now that you mention it, that reminds me of the story of Moses and um, and the mysterious figure al -Kidr. Yeah. Moses, who parts the Red Sea, you know, he's still humbled by al wisdom. It's like... 
El Kidder operates on this whole other level of awareness, one that logic alone just can't access. Precisely. And the text seems to be highlighting the limitations of just pure intellect. Yeah. When it comes to understanding these mysteries of the divine. Even someone like Moses, who, I mean, he spoke directly to God, still had more to learn. And I, maybe that's a good place to um, to pause and let all of this sink in for a bit. We've covered a lot of ground from Sirius as this being to the potential of humanity and the importance of direct experience. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Oh, yeah. There's, there's so much more to unpack. Like... Uh, the text has this perplexing take on time okay. and, and this concept called the sigil of divine unity that really, it, it warps your perception of reality. We'll dive into all of that and more when we return. Okay, we're back and ready to dive even deeper into the musings of Ganymede. We were just talking about Moses and al qadir and it made me think about this. If even someone like Moses had limitations when approaching the divine, what does that mean for us? It's a question the text seems to be encouraging us to explore. And one way it does this is by challenging our very understanding of reality itself. Remember that puzzling passage about the Queen of Sheba's throne being moved instantaneously? Yeah, it felt like we were suddenly reading a sci-fi novel. Is the musings of Ganymede suggesting some kind of time travel or warping of space? Not quite. But the text does hint at a non-linear reality where our typical understanding of time as a straight line might not be the whole picture. Okay, so if time isn't a straight line, what is it? And how does that connect to the Lord of Sirius? Think of it this way. Imagine looking at a tapestry. From the front, you see a design, a story unfolding. But flip it over and you see all these threads interwoven, connected in ways you couldn't see before. The text seems to suggest that the Lord of Sirius exists on the back of the tapestry of time, so to speak, able to see and perhaps even influence all those threads at once. So actions taken in the past could have repercussions in the present or even ripple into the future, all because of this interconnectedness. Exactly. And if you think about it, that concept isn't entirely foreign. We talk about the butterfly effect, how small actions can have huge unforeseen consequences. Maybe what the musings of Ganymede is suggesting is that this interconnectedness exists on a far grander cosmic scale. Which makes me think about those stories of prophets receiving guidance from the Lord of Sirius. If the Lord of Sirius isn't bound by our linear view of time, those encounters could be less about historical events and more about a timeless connection. Precisely. And it circles back to what we were discussing earlier about the importance of direct experience. If the Lord of Sirius operates outside our normal understanding of reality, trying to grasp its nature through logic alone might be like trying to catch smoke with a net. It's like that saying, the mind can only take you to the door, but the heart can open it. Uh. But if we're trying to tap into this other realm of experience, this gnosis, how do we even begin? Do we need to become hermits, renounce the world, and meditate for decades? The text doesn't advocate for any extreme measures. In fact, it emphasizes finding the extraordinary within the ordinary. It suggests that cultivating a heightened awareness of the natural world, of the subtle sensations and experiences we often take for granted, can open us up to deeper truths. It's about training ourselves to see the extraordinary in the everyday. Like, instead of just seeing a tree, we start to appreciate its interconnectedness to the sun, the soil, the air we breathe. We start to see the whole web of life pulsing around us. Precisely. And the musings of Ganymede takes this concept even further. Remember that we mentioned a mysterious term, the sigil of divine unity? Yeah, I've been wondering about that one. What exactly is a sigil? Is it like a symbol or something? In this context, you could think of it as a kind of key. Not a physical key, but a key to understanding. The text links this sigil of divine unity to both Sirius and something called the singularity. Wait, the singularity, like the technological singularity everyone's talking about these days, with artificial intelligence becoming more powerful than the human mind. It's easy to make that association with the term, but the concept of a singularity has been around for centuries, particularly within mystical traditions. In the context of the musings of Ganymede, it's less about technology and more about a point of ultimate origin, the source from which everything arises. Okay, so it's not about robots taking over the world. Yeah. But if this singularity is the source of everything, how does it connect to Sirius? And how does this sigil fit into all of this? Think of it this way. Imagine a single point of light that attains the potential for every color in existence. The singularity, as described in the text, is like that point of light. Sirius, then, might be seen as one of those colors emanating from it, a manifestation of the singularity's boundless potential within our physical universe. And the sigil of divine unity is the key to understanding this connection. 
to seeing how everything ultimately stems from a single source. That's one interpretation, but remember what we've been saying about direct experience. The musings of Ganymede seems to be hinting at a truth that can't be fully grasped by intellect alone. It's like trying to understand the taste of an apple by reading its chemical composition, you're missing the essence of the experience. So how do we use this sigil, this key? Is there a ritual or a meditation? The text doesn't lay out specific practices. Perhaps the sigil itself is less important than what it represents the potential for unity, for seeing the interconnectedness of everything in the universe. It's like that feeling you get when you look up at a starry night and realize just how vast the universe is and how we're all part of something much greater than ourselves. Exactly. And that sense of awe, that feeling of interconnectedness, maybe that's the closest we can get to grasping the true meaning of the sigil of divine unity. That's quite a journey we've been on just now, from questioning the nature of time to pondering the source of creation. It's like the musings of Ganymede is asking us to leave our assumptions at the door and embrace a whole new way of seeing the universe. And it's not done with us yet. There's still the matter of will, the power of words, and the ultimate goal of this mystical journey to explore. Sounds like we have a lot more to unpack when we return. You know, after exploring those connections between Sirius and the singularity and that sigil of divine unity, it's like, I don't know. Yeah. Language, it just starts to break down a bit, you know? Oh, you mean? It's like, how do you even put those kinds of concepts into words? It's true. Some of these ideas, they really push the boundaries of what we can express through language alone. And yet, the text itself, it emphasizes the power of words. Which seems kind of, I don't know, paradoxical, right? Mm. If words are limited, why even emphasize them? It's not so much a contradiction, I think, as a call to understand words differently. The musings of Ganymede suggest that words, they aren't just these tools for conveying information. They're active forces that actually shape our reality. So it's like the difference between, say, looking at a map and actually like setting out the journey, right? right exactly. The words are just a representation until we actually act on them, bring them into being. Exactly. The text it uses this analogy of seeds being planted. You know, when we speak a word, it's like we're planting a seed in this fertile ground of potential. Mm -hmm. And whether that seed grows into something, well, something beautiful or something destructive, that depends on the intention behind it. That makes me think about, like, how careful we have to be with our words, you know, like gossip or even negative self-talk. Right. Those aren't just like harmless sounds. They're planting these seeds of discord and doubt. Absolutely. And conversely, words of kindness, encouragement, love, they have the power to uplift, to inspire. The text even goes so far as to suggest that the act of creation itself, the very universe we're in, originated from a primordial sound, a word. Wow. Now that's a mind-bending concept. So. It makes you wonder about the true nature of sound, of vibration. It's like, is it possible that what we perceive as sound is just this tiny fraction of I don't know, a much larger symphony of creation that's just always unfolding. That's the beauty of these mystical texts, right? They open up these questions we might never have even considered otherwise. But the musings of Ganymede, it doesn't just leave us in this state of wonder. It also points to a path, a way to engage with these mysteries. And that's where the concept of will comes in. Okay, so we've talked about the importance of direct experience. We talked about the power of words. What role does will play in all of this? Well, the text presents will as that force that connects us to the divine. It suggests that we all possess a spark of this uh, divine will within us. And when we align our own personal will with that larger cosmic will, we tap into an extraordinary power. So it's not about like forcing things to go our way yeah. or bending the universe to our whims, but more about surrendering to something greater than ourselves. Exactly. It's about recognizing that we're part of something much, much larger than our individual egos. And when we align ourselves with that larger purpose, we actually become these conduits for a power that surpasses our limited understanding. Which makes me think about all those stories of like prophets and mystics who seem to accomplish these, I don't know, incredible feats. Mm. Maybe they weren't superhuman. Maybe they were just like really good at tapping into that universal will and letting it flow through them. It's a compelling thought, isn't it? And it actually circles back to what we were discussing earlier about, you know, knowing thyself. Right. Perhaps the more we understand our own motivations, our own desires, yeah. the easier it becomes to distinguish between our ego's will and those whispers of that larger divine will. It's like tuning our instruments to resonate with this uh, this cosmic symphony. Yes. And when we hit that perfect harmony, incredible things can happen. Absolutely. And what is the ultimate goal of this symphony? 
of this, uh, this mystical journey. The musings of Ganymede seems to suggest it's a state of unity, a return to that primordial oneness that existed before the singularity burst forth into, well, all this, the multiplicity of creation. So it's not about escaping this world. It's about recognizing our inherent interconnectedness with, well, with everything in it. Exactly. It's about seeing the spark of Sirius in every living thing, in every grain of sand, in every distant star. It's about understanding that separation is an illusion and that true fulfillment comes from embracing the unity that underlies all of existence. Wow. We've covered a lot of ground in this deep dive from yeah. exploring the mysteries of Sirius to, I don't know, questioning the nature of reality itself. The musings of Ganymede has given us a lot to ponder. It certainly has. And perhaps the most valuable takeaway is this. The journey itself is as important as the destination. The act of questioning, of seeking, of expanding our awareness, that's where the true transformation occurs. So to our listener, if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed by all these ideas, that's okay. The important thing is to keep exploring, keep asking questions, and keep seeking those unsheathed pearls of wisdom that are hidden well within us and all around us. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the musings of Ganymede. Until next time, keep looking up, keep digging deeper, and keep listening for those whispers of the universe.